what I'm talking about. Wait. Okay, now, from the beginning. Good morning, everybody. Morning. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the Springs Church. I'm glad that you're here this morning. Uh, can everybody hear me okay? All right. Has everybody had your coffee? I know we lost an hour. I mean, like, uh, did, you, did you get some rest last night? Uh, even though you I'm just so glad that you all are here. And thank you so much. Are you ready to get into the Word today? All right. We're going to continue our series called The Names of God. So everybody say that with me. The Names of God. And today we're going to talk about uh, specifically Jehovah Sabaoth. Sabaoth. I'm not sure if I said that correctly, but, uh, you know, just bear with me, okay? You spell it like, like uh, S-A-B-A-O-T-H, okay? Jehovah Sabaoth. And we're going to talk about what that name of God means today. But I want to start out with just a very honest and pointed question for you, okay? Have you ever faced a battle in life? Yeah? Okay. And you've just felt oppressed, or you felt overwhelmed, or you felt outnumbered by the enemy. Have you ever faced that kind of battle before? That's what we're going to talk about today. What do you do when you're in that kind of battle? What do you do when you're experiencing oppression? What do you do if you're in a battle and you feel outnumbered or overwhelmed with the enemy? This is, what I, this is what I mean by that, o- oppression. I, I mean, it feels like, I don't know if you've, you've felt like this before, but I've felt like there have been times in my life where I'm just so, like, spiritually down, like, a, like, a, uh, like an elephant is sitting on my chest, or, or like I can't sleep at night because I'm thinking about all the, the problems and the battles and the challenges that just, just won't stop racing through my head. And sometimes I, 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 when I'm talking about this, I, I feel like I just explain it like my heart is just heavy. Like there's just something wrong. There's something coming against me, and I just feel beat down, and my, my emotions are all drained, and I feel like I don't have any energy, and I'm all alone. I just feel defeated. Anybody ever felt like that before? Just feel defeated, deflated, beaten down, and alone. And I just feel like I'm utterly depressed, not depressed, but just oppressed, just attacked constantly. And now, if you, if, you, if you know me, if you've been around here uh, for any length of time, you know that I love to journal, okay? I'm an introvert. I love to journal and get my thoughts and feelings out on my journal. I write in it every single morning and every single uh, night, usually. And um, I've been doing this since I've been in middle school. And one of the things that I write down is just some gut-level honesty. Okay, is it okay if I just be very vulnerable with you for just a second? I was looking back in a few years ago, and I was going through one of the most rough, roughest times of my personal life. And I didn't know what to do. And I, re- and I wrote these words. I wrote, I have almost no motivation for anything. I've been praying and praying for God to be my strength, but I don't find him anywhere. And how do you fight when you don't feel like fighting? And each morning brings with it a deep sense of discouragement. I hate feeling this way because I feel like I've lost my joy in God's will for my life. I feel hopelessly oppressed, hopelessly oppressed by the powers of this dark world, and I honestly do not know what to do. 
So have you ever been at that place where you're going through this battle and you're just oppressed by the enemy? It's almost like a dark cloud that just follows you around and you can't seem to shake it and you can't, can't seem to get away from it and break free from it. Or, or maybe it's not oppression for you. Maybe it's just being overwhelmed. Anybody ever get overwhelmed with life? All right, some of you some of you guys are lying through your teeth because you should be raising you should be raising both hands standing up and saying hallelujah I get so overwhelmed with life. Maybe you can relate to this. You you busy people, you people who don't know how to say no to anything. Okay, maybe you can relate. You skip breakfast, you're, you're late for work, you forgot to pack little Johnny's lunch, your laundry basket is Mount Everest of dirty clothes, <laughs> your loved one is in the hospital, you can't seem to get to the grocery store to buy food for your, for your uh, family members, you still haven't returned that growing list of phone calls and text messages and emails, your mother needs you, your friend needs you, your husband needs you, your wife needs you, your kids need you, your boss needs you, you need to be cloned or counseled or caught up in the air or something to meet the Lord in the air to be with him forever, the, the enemy is telling you that you will never be good enough. And you will never have what it takes. You are not strong enough. You are too stressed out. You feel guilty, inadequate, and completely overwhelmed. Can you relate to that one? All right. Or maybe it's not oppression. Maybe it's not being overwhelmed for you. Maybe you just feel outnumbered. Like you feel alone. It's no fun being outnumbered. You history buffs. You think about uh, Davy Crockett and those 182 uh, men inside the Alamo. I'm from Tennessee, so I can talk about Davy Crockett, okay? But, but he was surrounded by about 1,500 Mexican soldiers during that battle. Or you can ask the kid that's on the playground surrounded by bullies. <clears throat> or you can ask my, my wife who is surrounded by testosterone in our house. She is completely outnumbered. I don't know how you do it. <laughs> Maybe you're outnumbered. Maybe you're the only Christian at the office. Maybe you're the only Christian on the job or in the classroom. Or maybe you're the only Christian in your family. It can even feel extremely lonely. Extremely discouraging. And it can feel like you have... No support, no one's got your back, no one's fighting for you, and no one is on your side. So, have you ever faced a battle where you, were, you felt like you were being oppressed, or overwhelmed, or outnumbered? Do any of those things ring true for your life today? And to be honest with you, most of us have been through those kinds of seasons in life before. Some of us are going through that season Right now, some of us are, go, are going to go through that season in the days and weeks to come, and you need to be prepared. You need to know the truth that God's word says for all of us because we can be oppressed. Spiritual oppression is a real thing, it's a very real thing because our enemy is very real and he's alive in the world today. We are bombarded with his lies. We are attacked and, and, and deceived in many ways. He tries to do what? To steal, to kill, and destroy our lives. He tries to distract us. He tries to distort God's word. He tries to intimidate us and to make us feel, feel completely fearful about living in this world. We're overwhelmed. We feel overwhelmed for all kinds of reasons, but, but what, one of the things that I do, if I feel overwhelmed, I'll, I'll either take a choice. I'll, I'll, I'll work extra hard to try to figure out the problem and work through it, or I'll just want to escape to run and hide <clears throat> because my problems, my struggles, my battles feel way too big and way too unfixable. For me to handle them on my own. 
Or maybe you're outnumbered and you, feel, and you feel you're just surrounded by enemies. You're surrounded by those that may be hostile to you and you just lost hope. And it feels like fear and hopelessness and impending destruction all wrapped up in this big, huge fireball and it's coming your way. So we all sometimes feel that darkness of oppression. I think we all sometimes feel the stress and the pressure of being overwhelmed. I think sometimes we all feel the fear of being outnumbered. So the question I want to pose to us today is, what do we do? What do we do when that is the season that we're going through? What do we do when the battle is facing us dead in the eyes? What do we do? I'm so glad you asked. Here's the answer, okay? We're going to look to our God. We're going to look to the truth of his word. We're going to look to Jehovah Sabaoth. Now, what in the world does Jehovah Sabaoth mean? Jot this down if you're taking notes with me. If you're not taking notes with me this morning, go ahead and jot this down anyway, okay? Um, <clears throat> that was a joke. Ha, ha, ha. Okay. Je <laughs> Thank you. Somebody said that was a good one. Yeah, all right. Jehovah Sabaoth, it means the God of power. The God of power. The all-powerful God, the divine warrior. It's used over 270 different times in the Bible. And it refers to this divine captain or this divine general who commands a mighty army. How many of you know that our God is not weak and his hand is not too short to save you? Our God is mighty to save. He is mighty in battle. He is the divine captain or general who commands the armies of heaven. In the King James Version, uh, the, the term Jehovah Sabaoth, that is a Hebrew term. It's translated this in the King James, the Lord of hosts. It's translated this in the NIV, the Lord of Almighty. In the, C, in the CSB, it's the Lord of armies. In the NCV, it's the Lord all-powerful. In the message paraphrase, it says the God of the angel armies. In the voice uh, message, uh, paraphrase, it says the eternal commander of heaven's army. This is Jehovah Sabaoth. Why is it important to know his name? Because it reveals his character. It reveals his, his attributes. And our God is not a weakling. He is strong. And he is the God of all power. David said it, said it like this in Psalm 24, starting in verse 7. He said this, Lift up your heads, you gates. Be lifted up, you ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. You see, when the king is welcomed with open gates and open doors, when he is welcomed with open minds and open hearts, he will come in. He goes on to say in verse 8, Who is this king of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty. The Lord, look at these words, mighty in battle. Verse 9 says, lift up your heads, you gates. Lift them up, you ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. Verse 10, who is he? This king of glory. And look at these words. It says, the Lord almighty. In Hebrew, it's Jehovah Sabaoth. He is this king of glory. Let me tell you a little bit more about him. Over in Amos chapter 4, verse 13, it says this, He who forms the mountains, who created the wind, and who reveals his thoughts to mankind, who turns dawn into darkness, and treads on the heights of the earth. Look at this phrase right here. The Lord God Almighty. 
In Hebrew, it's Jehovah Sabaoth. The Lord God Almighty is his name. Our God is not a weakling. And he's not unaware of the battles that you and I face every single day. And here's the big truth that I want us to just hear loudly and clearly this morning. Is our God, Jehovah Sabaoth, fights on behalf of his people when they are when? Oppressed. When they are overwhelmed. And when they are outnumbered. Now, is that good news today or what? Our God can step in and fight battles for us. When we have no strength and we have no wisdom, we don't know what it takes to change this or to face this or to deal with that situation or this person or this, or this thing. Our God will step in and he is mighty in battle and he will fight that battle for us. Somebody say amen to that. <clears throat> Number one, jot this down if you're taking notes. Jehovah, Jehovah Sabaoth fights for the oppressed. I want to just give you a biblical example of these things. This, this is the first instance that the phrase Jehovah Sabaoth is used in Scripture. It is found in 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 3, where, where we read that this guy named Elkanah, I, I, how many of you would like a name called Elkanah? Okay. He was married to Hannah and Peninnah. He had two wives. Now, that's where that's the, he went wrong, right there. Okay. <laughs> now, 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 3 said this. Year after year, this man went up from his town to worship and sacrifice to the Lord Almighty, to Jehovah Sabaoth at Shiloh. Now, there was trouble in this guy's home. Amen? Can you imagine why? Okay, he had two wives, and they were battling each other. They were at each other. Peninnah had children, but Hannah was barren. And she was bothered by this whole ordeal. And in that culture back then, barrenness was thought to be a sign of God's displeasure. And in verse 6, it gives us a little bit of a description of the character and personality of Peninnah. 1 Samuel chapter 6, it says, Because the Lord had closed Hannah's womb, her rival kept provoking her in order to irritate her. Do you guys know anything about being provoked or being irritated? Or, or am I the only one? Okay. So she couldn't just be thankful that she had children, but she felt the need to harass Hannah. She went out of her way to provoke, and I looked that word up, provoke, and it means to cause thunder. Have you been provoked before where just inwardly you were stirred up and you were like so mad it was like being around a bunch of thunder? <clears throat> it was not just a little bit of bothering, but it was, it was thunder. And Peninnah was trying to get Hannah to blow her top. <clears throat> Hannah's back was against the wall. And she needed God to do battle for her. She was bitter. She was broken. And she was oppressed. But my friends, she did the right thing. She turned to God and she called out to Jehovah Sabaoth. And Jehovah Sabaoth heard her and answered her. Look at this verse in 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 11. And she made a vow saying, Lord Almighty, Jehovah Sabaoth, if you will only look on your servant's misery and remember me and not forget your servant, but give her a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life and no razor will ever be used on his head. What's going on here? She needed to know the God of power. 
She was broken, bitter, and oppressed, and she needed a miracle. She was being provoked and irritated, and she, her back was up against the wall. She was at the end of her rope, but God, everybody say, but God, but God heard her prayer and answered her and gave her a son, and that son was named Samuel, who became a mighty prophet for the nation of of Israel, Jehovah Sabaoth fights for the oppressed. Number two, jot this down. Jehovah Sabaoth fights for the overwhelmed. He fights for the overwhelmed. I'm so glad that God shows up in power. When we in ourselves, we are overwhelmed. When the problems in front of us seem so huge, so big, that we want to jet and run the other Way. You remember the story of David and Goliath? This is found in 1 Samuel 17. Remember, the Philistines were the arch enemies of Israel. And they, they had gathered for war to take on God's people. And the Philistines had a champion named Goliath. He was two feet taller than Shaq. Okay? Now I want you to think about how big Goliath was. He's huge. If there was any reason for David to be overwhelmed, it was because of Shaquille, I mean Goliath, okay? <clears throat> he, was, he was decked out in body armor he, that, that weighed uh, about 125 pounds by itself. He was armed with a javelin, a spear, and, a, and, a, and he had a shield bearer. And this mammoth of a man challenged the Israelites to a WWF smackdown. Okay, you guys wrestling fans in here? Okay. <laughs> this mammoth of a man challenged the Israelites to a fight, to a battle. And he yelled out blasphemies against God. And young David's job was simply just to go take some bread and some cheese to the commander of the unit and also check on, check on his older brothers who were in the fight, see how they were doing. But when David was there, he heard Goliath shouting his usual defiance. And this taunting had been going on twice a day for 40 days. Just imagine the situation. And each time the Israelites heard Goliath's voice, they all ran away in great fear. And then David asked the question that really should have been asked long ago. And David asked the quest question, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? And David's older brother came, and, and he was mad and basically told David to go back to his cheese, curds, and shepherding. You don't, you don't need to be out here on the front lines, young David. But then Saul, the king of Israel, heard about David's courage and sent for him. You following with me? Okay. David said to Saul, let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go out and fight him. Saul tries to dismiss David's courage, but David reminds Saul how he killed the lion, how he killed the, a bear, and he had been up against the wall before, and he had seen God fight his battles. David had experienced Jehovah Sabaoth in the past. And now that he was up against this, this uh, Philistine giant, guess what? David had history with God. And David knew how strong God was. David knew how much of a battler, of a divine warrior, of the captain of the host that, that God really was. And it, David goes on to say, The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion... The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the bear will also deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul then told David to go for it. Tried to give him some of his armor, but it didn't fit. And David put it down. 
he picked up what he was used to. He picked up his staff, his slingshot, and he, find, he found five smooth stones, and he went off to face this Philistine giant. And when Goliath came closer to David and saw that he was just a boy, Goliath despised him and said, Am I a dog that you come at me with sticks? And after teasing him, he called out a curse on David and declared that he would feed him to the birds and to the beasts. But I want you to look at this scripture, and this is what's going to be up on the screen. This is in 1 Samuel 17. I want you to catch this this morning. In verse 45, it said, David said to the Philistine, You come against me with a sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, Jehovah Sabaoth the God of the armies of Israel whom you have defiled. Verse 46, this day the Lord will deliver you into my hands, and I'll strike you down and I will cut off your head. This very day I will give the carcass of the Philistine army to the, to the birds, and through the wild animals and through the whole world, and then the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. Verse 47, all those gathered here will know, look at this, that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves. For the battle is the Lord's, and he will give all of you into our hands. Now think about this. Think about how powerful our God is. Think about the confidence that David had in his God. In David's eyes, God was the giant. And Goliath was the goon. Do you see the difference? Most of us would think the other way around. But God was the giant. David was so confident in Jehovah Sabaoth as the commander of the armies of heaven that he didn't even bother considering being overwhelmed. He had history with God. And with his trust in God and with his stones, he, he, in his sling, he slayed that giant. I want you to know today that God fights for the oppressed. God fights for the overwhelmed. And number three is this, if you're taking notes with me, Jehovah Sabaoth fights for the outnumbered. He fights for the outnumbered. In 2 Kings 6, there was a story about the prophet Elisha, and he had managed to outrage this enemy king. And Elisha was, was a, because Elisha was giving divine insight, he was giving divine intelligence to the army of Israel, and this evil king's plans were being ruined. And this evil king was just so mad at Elisha. And when this king determined where Elisha was, he mobilized his army complete with Horses and chariots and all the warriors to surround the city and set up an ambush to annihilate the prophet Elisha. And when Elisha's servant got up the next morning to read the newspaper, he looked up and he saw a mighty army encircling the city. And he panicked. He was afraid. He didn't know what to do. He woke up Elisha. And he said, Elisha, what in the world are we going to do? We're surrounded by people who want to annihilate us. We are way outnumbered. You see, this servant had a vision problem. But his problem wasn't with his physical eyes. His problem was with his spiritual eyes. He couldn't see in the spirit. He couldn't see spiritual vision. His physical eyes worked fine, but he needed some spiritual spectacles, I call them, to be able to see the truth of God, to be able to see the truth of the reality that is going on. How many of you know that what we see is not all there is? <clears throat> His servant 
saw the danger, but he could not see the deliverance. My friends, some of you are surrounded by enemies, it feels like, and maybe you're seeing the danger, but you need to be reminded of the truth, that you don't miss the deliverance for the danger. You need to see into the scripture, you need to see into the spirit and realize that those that are with you are greater than those who are with your enemies. 2 Kings 6, verse 16 and 17, this is up on the screen, it says this, Do not be afraid, the prophet answered. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Verse 17, and Elijah prayed, open his eyes, Lord, so that he may see. Would you say that with me? Open my eyes, Lord, that I may see. One more time. Open my eyes, Lord, that I may see. Then the Lord opened the servant's eyes, and he looked, and he saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. This was the army of God. These were the, ar- these were the angel armies. Our God is that eternal commander of the armies of God. And if you were able to see into your situation, if you were able to see the reality of what's happening in the spirit in your world, you would be encouraged, my friends, because there is help for you. There is deliverance for you. And our God is not ever going to leave you to battle by yourself. Or he's not ever going to leave you alone. No, he is the mighty commander of all the hosts of heaven. I want to encourage you today. Don't miss your divine deliverance today. Because your, your eyes are on earthly danger. The servant thought he and Elisha were greatly outnumbered. But in actuality, the armies of Jehovah Sabaoth were arrayed against the enemy. Beloved, never forget that even if it's just you and God, that's a majority, and you will win every single time. The victory is yours. Why? Because God is with you. God is beside you. God is beside you. He is fighting your battles for you. Are you trusting him? Are you calling out to him? Are you leaning and depending upon him to fight those battles for you? Your God, this is up on the screen. Your God, Jehovah Sabaoth, goes to battle for you when your back is up against the wall. Yeah, our enemy is real. Yeah, our enemy tries to steal and kill And destroy and defeat and bring destruction upon you. But here's the powerful truth that we need to remember today. And it's this. God is greater than anything that we may face in this life. And he still fights our battles for us today. Amen. So if you're in the heat of battle right now or if you're just hot in this room right now like me. Or if the enemy feels like he's hot on your trail. Please know that you're not alone. You'll never be alone. Neither are you left to fight on your own. So if you feel oppressed, like Hannah did, remember to call upon your God. Remember to call upon his name. And and trust him to rescue you and to provide a miracle that you need in your life. If there's good reason for you to feel overwhelmed... Because you're facing a giant of some sort? Remember this, your God, the King of glory, Jehovah Sabaoth, the Lord all-powerful, the eternal commander of, of heaven's armies, will fight for you. And if you feel outnumbered, like Elisha's servant, against the enemy that was surrounding them, remember, your God. And his heavenly armies are much greater 
much more numerous, much more powerful than anything that the enemy can throw against you. And it reminds me that if God be for us, who can be against us? Would you say that with me? If God be for me, who can be against me? Say that like you mean it. Come on, guys, wake up. I know it's hot in here, but stay with me. If God be for me, who can be against me? So I want to give you some takeaways right here. I want you to remember these, especially this week, especially those of you who are going through battles of some sort. If it's oppression, if it's overwhelmingness, if it's being outnumbered, I want you to remember this. Number one, battles are inevitable. They come to us all. From time to time, we're all going to face spiritual oppression, overwhelming circumstances, or the feeling of being outnumbered by the enemy. Battles are going to come. But here's what we need to remember right here, and this is the important point for you today. Don't run away from your battles or try to solve them on your own. Instead, ask Jehovah Sabaoth to go to battle for you. Somebody like that. Come on, that was good stuff. Now, I'm just going to come down here and preach to myself because Pastor Brian, boy, that was good stuff. Amen, Pastor Brian. That was so good. In fact, I'm just going to leave that right there because we're going to let the Holy Spirit speak to us right there. Because too many of us are running away from our battles. We don't need to run away from our battles because you don't have to fight them. You don't have to figure them out in your own uh, mental capacities. You don't have to do that. No, you can call upon your God because he is standing ready to to step up and to go before you and fight on your behalf. Amen? Amen. Jot this down. Remember who your God is. Remember who God is. Remember the truth of his word. Remember that he is the king of glory. Remember that he is the Lord God almighty. Remember that he is all powerful. Remember that there is nothing too difficult for him. Remember who your God is. Remember who you are. Remember that you're a beloved child of his. You are a son or a daughter of the most high God. You are beloved. You will never be alone. Jesus said he would never leave us. He would never forsake us. You are the apple of his eye. You are a treasured possession. And he loves you so much. And there is value in you that you may not even understand yourself. But remember who you are. You are worth something. You are worth everything. That God loves you so much that he sent his only son to die in your place so that you could have a relationship with God, your father, so that you could experience the joy and the peace of salvation. He loves you that much. Remember who you are. You are a beloved child of his And when something comes against you, it comes against him. And do you think he's going to stand idly by and let his children be oppressed continually? To be overwhelmed? To be outnumbered? No. You have a God. You have a father. You have the captain of the host on your side and going to fight your battles for you. Will you call out to him? Will you trust him? So let me invite the worship team up because I want to ask you a question. What battle, what battle do you need to give God and let him fight for you? What are you going through today? What is the Holy Spirit saying to you in this season of your life? What battle are you facing? Because whatever it is, he wants to step step in and fight for you because our God 
is mighty in battle. Call upon Jehovah Sabaoth, the God of all power, and trust him to fight your battles. Because why? Because he fights for the oppressed. He fights for the overwhelmed. And he fights for those who may feel outnumbered in this life. Would you stand with me, please?